How many of you grew up watching horror movies? Ever since I was a kid, all I could do was watch these movies. I always watched movies like Dracula or Jason and Freddy Slashers. But aside from those well-known figures, there was something that interested me more. Ghosts. As a kid, I was obsessed with capturing ghosts. I would get into trouble and search for places where it was too dangerous for a child. As a teenager, I kept looking, but little by little, I began to lose faith in it. When I was older, I made a YouTube channel to look for ghosts, but to tell you the truth, it's all lies. I started looking for ghosts, but my videos were too boring because no matter where I went, I never found anything. I got to the point where I stopped believing in the paranormal completely, so I put together my own scares for YouTube videos. But one day, the least expected happened. I finally discovered that ghosts are real. Do you know what else I discovered that day? That you can't play with them. I would have preferred to continue not believing or seeing anything in my whole life because what I saw that day taught me to be terrified of what awaits us after death. That day, I got a small glimpse of pure evil. It all started in an old movie theater that to my surprise was still in operation. The place was just a society of promotion where sometimes they showed movies to their members. My interest in this place arose when I found several videos on the internet where the chairs moved by themselves. The tables fell down and the doors slammed violently. Okay, clearly it was all staged, but I didn't care. The video got enough attention for me to go see what was going on. I talked to the people at the local community association where the movie theater was located, and the response of the people was quite surprising. I knew it was all a lie, but the employees and people I was able to interview were pretty convinced that it was all true. I thought maybe the hoax was just a few and everyone believed it was true. In truth, that's the best way to maintain a lie. Make as few people part of it as possible. The place was private, so I couldn't do much more than ask questions. What the locals didn't know was that I planned to go much further. After asking a few questions, I stayed hidden in the place while they closed it. When it got dark, when there was no one else in the place, I took up my video and photo camera and started to explore the place. I knew nothing was going to happen, so I brought some strings and wires to create the scares on my own. Without fear, I started to walk around the cinema area to see where I could put the wires to create fake scares. I approached the movie theater chair and set up the scares to move them by hand as I left. I also left some glass on top of a piece of furniture to break. Everything was perfectly set up, so I started the performance. I filmed myself walking around the place in the dark. I was prepared to cause the first scare. But instead, the scare came to me. A chair had moved by itself. I recognized that chair. That was the chair I had put the string on. But I had not manipulated it, nor had the string pulled my hand. I was confused. Maybe it was an accident. Anyway, I kept filming, since at least I had captured a totally natural and believable reaction. I paused the video and went to check the thread. It was intact. I was about to start filming again in another part of the theater. But before I started, I heard a noise that made my camera fall over. The door near me gave a terrible bang that sent a roar throughout the movie theater. In this place, there was no wind. Everything was closed, and it even felt suffocating. There was no way that bang could have been a coincidence, and I didn't believe the story that there were ghosts in that place. Someone was with me. Someone was probably guarding the place, and when they saw me, they wanted to continue their little joke and scare me too. Ghosts or not, that place was no longer safe. I couldn't film or do anything if there were people watching my every move. I headed for the exit when I realized something. I was forgetting my camera on the floor. I went back to the movie theater and that's when I realized that none of this was an elaborate prank. There was no way that what was in front of me was fake. I started to make sure that what I was seeing was real. Sitting in the same chair that had moved by itself. Sitting in that chair where I had put a thread. Someone, or rather something, was sitting. That thing that was there was not human. It was the most horrifying and creepy being I had ever seen in my life. Its body had a humanoid shape, but was deformed and out of a nightmare. 
What frightened me the most were its eyes and mouth. Its mouth was full of terrifyingly long teeth while its eyes, compressed backward, were huge and black and stared at me in a terrifying way as if obsessed with me. I walked slowly backward, not knowing how I could react to what I was seeing, but the door closed again in front of me. When I looked forward again, the monster was gone, but all the chairs had turned around. They were all facing me. I looked on in disbelief. I remember telling myself that all this had to be a joke. None of it could be real. That paranormal thing didn't exist. Suddenly, the chairs began to move slowly in my direction. All the doors except the one behind me opened and closed violently. I fell to the ground in terror, and when I realized, the monster was in front of me. All he did was stare at me with a huge grin and his eyes completely dilated. I was unable to move. I didn't know if he was doing something to me or if it was just my fear, but I was completely frozen. Aware of this, the monster stuck his two fingers in my mouth and started to pull them apart with an enormous superhuman force. With each passing second, I could feel my mouth opening wider and wider. The tissues of my lip were being destroyed and my jaw was breaking. At the same time, he put his other hand on my eyes where he pressed his fingers very slowly into my eyes, squeezing them tighter and tighter. At that point, I couldn't see anything, but I could feel liquid all over my face and I could tell it was my blood. On the other side, I could feel a laugh, the laugh of the monster that didn't kill me because it didn't want to, because it seemed to enjoy every second of what I was doing. Ah! And suddenly, it's all over. When I woke up, I realized I was in an alley a few blocks away from the movie theater. When I looked at the time, it was 8 p.m. You know what was the strangest thing? The date was the same, just a few hours earlier. I approached the movie theater again, asking for answers, and the people in charge of the place told me that I had been asking questions, but that I had left an hour ago, as if nothing had happened, as if I had never hidden or spent the night there. But you know, it was all real. Since that day, my jaw has hurt a lot and my eyes burn. There are times when I wake up and vomit dirt, and other times I see shadows where there is nothing. Do you know what the worst part of all this is? It's been two years now, and all this is still happening to me. I still don't understand why I am still alive. Maybe that thing didn't want to kill me in that place. Maybe it was a warning, or maybe it enjoyed more the fact that I was being consumed over time, slowly, like a decomposing corpse. Whatever it is, I will live whatever is left of my life without looking for the paranormal. Although I know that sooner or later, the paranormal will find me. When you were kids, what did you think when you were all alone? All parents are very careful not to leave their children alone, but at some point, they have to. What was your first time? Were you afraid? Were you relieved and happy? Did something bad happen to you? To be honest, my first time being alone was the worst. Being very young, maybe even too young, to be alone for the first time. I had a horrifying experience that no child or adult should ever have in their life. An experience which I miraculously got out of alive. Because, at a very young age, I knew human madness at its maximum expression. It all started when I was 11 years old. I'll be honest, I'm not a parent, and I'm not sure if that's the right age to leave a child alone. I just know that in my particular case... I was too young, and I didn't feel safe. Since I always behaved well, my parents had no problem leaving for an hour during the night to pick up my brother for a birthday party. At that point, they decided that this was the perfect opportunity for me to experience a short time of being alone, so they could see if I got into any mischief. I wanted to go with them in the car, see my brother, and fall asleep on the ride back. But I guess my parents thought it was the best thing for me, or at least... That's what they told me as a kid. Once they left in the car, I turned on the TV and found an animated movie. I was very entertained and distracted, waiting for the night to pass quickly and for my parents and sibling to arrive. 
when suddenly I heard a loud knock on the door. Hey, it's me, Mom. Open the door. I didn't know who that lady was, but I knew one thing for sure. That wasn't my mom. I had no idea who she was, but she was scaring me very much. The banging and screaming of that lady was getting more and more violent. She wanted to get into the house at all costs, screaming desperately for me to open the door for my mother. She said that she was my mother and she was going to take care of me, that if I didn't open the door, she was going to be very angry with me and she'd have to punish me. For a moment I thought about opening the door, just out of fear that she would come in anyway. But I remembered what my parents had told me. I should never open the door for any stranger, no matter what they tell me. Opening the door only makes things worse. At that instant, the noises at the door stopped and I calmed down, thinking it was all over. I ran to the dining room window and opened it just to see if the terrifying woman was gone. Maybe with a little luck, I could see her leaving and then tell my parents. <laughs> the lady! The lady was in front of the window! She'd already seen me! She was staring at me with a huge, twisted smile, trembling with anticipation and nerves. Hey, kid! Why don't you open it for me? Don't you recognize me? Hi, Mom! Scared, I ran as fast as I could to my room to hide. I turned off the light and got under my sheets, but soon I realized that this was a lousy hiding place. So I got out of my sheets and went under my bed. Come to think of it, that hiding place wasn't much better. But can you blame me? I was an 11-year-old boy being harassed by a woman who was trying to break into my house. I stayed under the bed, crying quietly, when I heard a crash at the window. From my room, I could see everything that was going on. The glass had suddenly exploded and a brick had entered our house. Behind the brick, the woman came in, walking slowly with a huge smile on her face. Mommy's home! Where are you, little boy? Are you hiding so you won't eat your vegetables? The woman began to look everywhere, slowly scanning the house for me. I feel that I could have escaped several times, but I didn't dare to do so. With the excuse of looking for the best time to escape through the window, I missed several opportunities where I could have ran. I was terrified. I didn't know if I could have run, even if I had the perfect opportunity. After a few minutes, it was finally time to search my room. Hmm. I feel the naughty boy is here. Come out, come out. I promise not to do anything to you. Come out, little brat. Come out now or I swear I'll break your legs. Do you want to make your mom look ridiculous in front of all these people? Do you think this is a game? If I find you, I swear I'll kill you. Oh, are you under the bed? You better not be here, you little scumbag. I'll fill you full of holes. Why? Why are all my children abandoning me? I just want to be a good mother. <laughs> I found you! As soon as she found me, the woman grabbed my feet and dragged me from under the bed. With a big smile, she grabbed both of my arms and started shaking me back and forth as if trying to relax a baby, but in a total careless and painful way. From one second to the next, she froze. Her face had changed. Now she was looking at me with hatred and resentment. Why did you hide from me? Is it because you don't want to take a bath? Furious, the woman grabbed my arm while I was crying and took me to the bathroom. Without letting go of me, she turned on the faucet to the sink. We washed our hands and, after covering it, she plunged my face into the little water that had filled up, trying to drown me. Waste! You are trash! I didn't raise you to be a filthy insect. You're just like your father. A useless, filthy, filthy scum! You horrible, filthy little brat! Luckily, there was too little water to drown me, and in an oversight of the woman, I bit her hand and ran away as fast as I could. I ran around the house looking for the door, but it was locked. I turned around and the woman was standing there, staring at me, this time with a knife in her hands. Hey, I'll forgive you for what you did to me. I just want to be with you. Come, come. Crying, I ran desperately to the window as the woman chased me. Surprisingly, she was much slower than I was, as if she had trouble walking. I ran to my neighbor's house crying while the woman screamed at me from the house. 
No! Come back! Why are you leaving me? I did everything I could! I'm sorry! I tried to tell the neighbors everything, but there was no need. They were already listening to the woman, screaming in desperation and panic. Shortly after my parents arrived with my brother, they were surprised to see the police at my house. As soon as they saw me, they hugged me, crying, asking me to forgive them for leaving me alone. Once the police entered my house, they found the strange woman sitting on the floor of my room, hugging a teddy bear. She said it was her son, and that they were not going to take him away from her. As she said this, she was stabbing the bear with a huge knife all over its body. The woman was immediately taken to a mental institution. When I grew up, my parents told me that, like me, this woman was also a victim. She had lost a pregnancy due to an act of violence by her partner, and she was never able to come to her senses. It just got worse and worse and worse over time. Her family tried to take care of her without taking her to a mental health center, but it was too much for them, and a few days before, she'd slipped away. Today, I feel empathy for the woman. She didn't really have any bad intentions towards me, but she was totally out of her mind. To tell you the truth, it took me years to encourage myself to be alone. There's not a day that goes by that I don't think about that woman. I remember it like it was yesterday. In those moments, I just smile and am glad to be alive. Hello, my name is Ace. I'm just an ordinary person. Maybe a little lonely, but not because I have any problems or because I like to be alone. I just didn't meet anyone to have a relationship with. I'm a very simple person. I spend most of my days working and going out with my friends on the weekends. Nothing too hectic. We just get together to have a drink and watch a soccer game. Well, to be honest, I would be lying if I told you that I am totally alone. I have a faithful and cute dog named Chad, who I named after the drummer of the Red Hot Chili Peppers. Although I admit I'm not being entirely honest, aside from my boring life, I had a secret. I'm an OnlyFans model. This was one of the only things that gave my life excitement. An innocent and exciting side that no one at my job would expect from me. No one knows I do these things. And more than for the money, I do it for the thrill of doing something different. There really isn't much that sets me apart from anyone else besides that little secret. But when danger lurks, that means absolutely nothing. I used to think that the craziest and most dangerous things happened to those who were asking for it. I always knew that crime was real and could happen to anyone. But who would notice me? Someone who doesn't attract attention who doesn't have the nicest house in the neighborhood, who doesn't have a flashy car and has a dog. Someone that may work in OnlyFans, but there is absolutely no way someone knows it. Although apparently, someone did. And that person was not only a criminal, he was a monster. He was the most cruel and sadistic person that could appear. And if he hadn't received help, he would surely be one more victim of this terrifying monster today. It was a Tuesday night, I had just returned from work. As soon as I was home again, I went to open the patio door to smoke a cigarette and look at the sky, as I always used to do before checking my OnlyFans. During that time, I kept the dog locked inside the house. Chad was not bad company, but he could stay in the kitchen eating while I spent 10 minutes in complete peace and quiet. The night was very starry and it was much quieter than usual. This was because my neighbors had gone on vacation and their kids weren't around. After smoking my cigarette, I relaxed and leaned back, almost lying on the grass when I heard a noise coming from inside the house. It was a slamming door. At first, I wondered if Chad was the cause, so I went into the house to check it out. Once I was inside, I walked around the house and looked for the source of the sound when a terrifying thought crossed my mind. There was no way Chad could have knocked on a door. When I just got home from work, all the doors were locked with a key I left behind the TV in the dining room. And even if he accidentally left the door open, Chad is not the type of dog to walk into any room uninvited, specifically the one where I have the only fans equipment. By the time I started to notice all these things and suspect that maybe something strange was going on, it was too late. When I got to the source of the sound, I realized that it was the door to my room, and behind it, locked in, Chad was crying. I went to open the door, but before I could open it, I felt a horrible, painful prick in my neck. When I turned around, I was confronted by a terrifying man who easily gave me a bear hug that completely immobilized me. The man was huge. His body was also gigantic. It was as if a being with superhuman strength had appeared in my house with the firm intention of attacking me. 
Meanwhile, I still felt the prick in my neck, and after inspecting it with my eyes while the huge assailant squeezed me, I entered into absolute panic when I realized what was the source of my pain. This man had stuck a syringe in my neck, and all the liquid from that syringe had entered me. I know your little secret. What? Who are you? What do you want? You've been a naughty boy, haven't you? Let me go. What did you do to me? All those photos and videos you take. Do you think you are beautiful? Don't you? What do you mean? What was in that syringe? You'll see. <laughs> I pushed him and started to run around the dining room, taking out the syringe and throwing it on the floor. But I could not advance many meters because before leaving, the man jumped on top of me and threw me to the floor again. Once we were both on the floor, he jumped on top of me and began to choke me with all his strength. I put up all the resistance I had, and even though he was taller and more muscular than me, I managed to free myself and give him a blow that took him away from me for a few seconds. I took advantage of that time to stand up and keep running. The door was locked. I couldn't escape through there, and I didn't even have the keys. My only option was to run to the courtyard and jump into the neighbor's house. I ran at full speed into the yard until I felt something electrocute me and I fell to the ground, my body aching behind me. I could see the psychopath very close to me, approaching me with a taser gun in his hands. Do you think you can escape, naughty boy? That easy? P pl please let me go. Immobilized and shaking from the pain, I could only watch as the man came closer and closer to me, showing me a small fork he had taken from my kitchen. At that moment, I noticed that he didn't grab a knife or something sharp. He grabbed a fork. We are going to have so much fun. We are so lucky you have so many cameras, <laughs> naughty boy. This man was really very sadistic, and he was going to enjoy hurting me. Once the man was a few centimeters away from me, I was thinking about how to give him the last fight, how to escape from the situation that seemed inescapable, and the answer came by itself. Chad jumped violently towards him, biting him on the arm and making him fall to the ground in pain. After a few seconds of fighting, the man was about to hit him, but he couldn't do it. I took advantage of those seconds of distraction to grab a small ceramic statue I had in the yard and violently smash it into his head, knocking him unconscious. It was all over, and my dog and I were safe. Once I called the police, they surprised me and arrived immediately. It was as if they were already around, secretly looking for who I had caught. Soon after, the truth came out. The man who stalked me was a former psychiatric patient. He wasn't really crazy, but somehow he faked insanity perfectly well to avoid going to jail. Once he escaped from the psychiatric hospital, he took his evil to a new city, my city, where he was seen wandering around. But until that day, they could never catch him. I was never the same person after that day. I left OnlyFans, not because there was something wrong with it, but now I'm afraid, afraid that someone else wants to come for me. Maybe someone that recognizes my room. I don't know. I know it doesn't make sense, but I'm really scared. I'm still alone, or rather, with Chad. I still look out for him, remembering every time I see his eyes that night, he jumped out of the window of the room I was locked in, went around the yard, came straight to face the danger, and saved my life. I guess you are all wondering what was in that syringe and what that man injected me with, right? I'm sorry to tell you that I don't have an answer. They didn't find anything strange at the hospital, so it could have been anything. Maybe something harmless, maybe something disgusting, or maybe now there is something inside me that still can't be detected and will wake up in the future. For a 50-year-old divorcee, life is no piece of cake. You invest all your youth in a man only for him to cheat on you. When you lose your youth and your skin starts to have wrinkles. That's my story, by the way. After the divorce, I moved into my aunt's house where she left me in her will. The house was a bit old, but had a classic vintage vibe to it. It was a two-story house with two bedrooms, a kitchen, and a spacious living room. Both of my kids are happily married and busy with their lives, while I am adjusting to this new single life. The only good part about the post-divorce life is the peace of mind I have and this beautiful house. I have a stable job. But sometimes the loneliness gets to me. When I shared this with my daughter, she told me to go on Tinder. I am a woman who met men at bars and at friends' birthday parties. 
Back in the day, we didn't have these online dating options, so I was appalled that my daughter would even suggest something like that. But after a few weeks, when meeting men in person was getting more and more difficult, I created a profile on Tinder. My daughter even helped me to make my profile more appealing. Interesting enough, there were a lot of single men on this app who were around my age and going through a similar life situation. I matched with a few men, but it fizzled out as soon as it started. My dating life had come alive after almost 30 years. I was having some troubles in the house. Every night, I heard screams and banging of cabinet doors at night. At first, I thought someone had broken into my house, but later, I realized that it was an old house. And sometimes at night, when the temperature dropped and the wind blew, the house made creepy noises. Also, there was a big floor-to-ceiling mirror fixed right in front of the stairs that led upstairs. I hated that mirror. Not only was it placed in the wrong place, it was also very old. I hired a contractor to get it off the wall, but the darn thing wouldn't budge. I decided to let it go, but as the days passed, the mirror freaked me out more and more. But then one evening, while I was having dinner all by myself, my phone buzzed, and I had matched with one man. His name was Michael. He was recently divorced and was looking for a loving female companion. He was two years my senior and was living in the same city. We began chatting, and soon the chatting turned into constant texting. We were always talking to each other. Michael was just so easy to talk to. Also, somehow, we had a lot more in common. It felt as if I had met him sometime. We even started talking on phone calls. He sounded a bit old, but I knew the stress of a separation can age you quickly. I didn't mind one bit. In all the pictures he sent me of himself, he looked like a man in his mid-fifties with salt and pepper hair, average height, and a comparatively lean build. He was exactly the man I would go for. We talked all the time, and this made me forget all the strange occurrences in my house. We talked about everything, our kids, our jobs, our exes, our early life, and even what we want from our future. It felt wholesome to find someone who aligns with you, your vision, and your expectations so well. But there was one thing that used to put me off all the time. Even after weeks of talking, Michael was not yet ready to meet me. We lived in the same city, so it would not be difficult for us to meet up over dinner or lunch, perhaps. But he always gave me excuses. Sometimes it would be work, commitments with his kids and whatnot. I always believed him, because he made me feel like a teenager who was experiencing love for the first time. Yes. I had fallen in love with him in such a short period without even meeting him once. I even told my daughter that he might be the one. My sad life had taken a complete 360 after matching with Michael. I was so thankful that I took my daughter's advice and installed Tinder. One night, however, as I was sleeping, the noises in my house were too loud. I grabbed a glass vase from my bedroom and slowly walked downstairs but found the house completely empty. I chalked it up to be nothing and slept peacefully. The next day, however, I had a meeting in the neighboring town, so I was going to be out of town for two days. I checked into the hotel, all while I and Michael were constantly communicating. He had sent me a picture of him in his kitchen cooking breakfast. It was so wonderful that we shared pictures of such small moments with each other. The hotel was very big, so I decided to walk in the park while I spoke on a call with Michael. We spent a good hour talking to each other and hung up as it was dinner time. As I was walking towards the dining hall, I saw a man standing in the hallway. And I had a very broad smile on my face. I immediately ran up to him and threw myself in his arms. I was hoping that the man would hug me back, but instead, he pushed me aside and looked very perplexed and even a bit scared. I instantly sobered up and said, Michael, hey, it's me, Bella. He stared at me for a good five seconds, and then said in a very polite tone, I'm sorry, ma'am. I don't know who you are. You probably mistook me for someone else. Aren't you Michael? I asked while I controlled hard to reel back my tears. No, ma'am. I'm Alex. Even though my brain had accepted what was happening, 
My heart refused to believe that my Michael would do something like that with me. Michael, please do not prank me. This is serious, I said. That's when a woman approached us and intertwined her hands with the man in front of me. She asked him what was wrong. He politely explained. The woman looked at me with worry. I whipped my phone out and went to Tinder. I showed the man and the woman all the text and the photos. These are photos I've posted on Instagram. And I'm not on Tinder, ma'am. This is my wife. I don't need these apps. I think someone has catfished you. The reality of my situation sunk in at that moment, and I just ran back to my room crying hysterically. I was so heartbroken that I just wanted to go home and curl up in my bed and cry. I didn't give a shit about the meeting or anything at all. I checked out that night itself and drove home bawling my eyes out. The moment I reached home, my neighbor, an elderly woman, was walking her dog out. She called out to me and said, It was nice meeting your new boyfriend this afternoon. He is a really sweet man, and I got lucky twice. I did not understand a thing, and I was not in the headspace to process anything the woman said. But the moment I stepped into my house, my mind was instantly lifted off Michael and me being catfished and brought back to reality. All the lights were on. The TV was on. There were snacks on the kitchen counter. There was a load of laundry in the dryer and a bunch of dishes and cups in the sink. I thought maybe my daughter was home, but when I checked the whole house, there was no one. I immediately called the police. I was so drained emotionally that I did not even feel scared at that moment. While I was descending the stairs, my sight fell on the huge-ass mirror, and as I saw my reflection in it, all the emotions came swirling back, and I just grabbed a hammer from the kitchen and started hitting the mirror. The cops arrived soon after, and I had barely chipped the huge mirror when they asked me what was wrong. I told them that someone had broken into my home and had used everything. They scouted the whole house and found no one. One of the officers asked me why I was breaking the mirror, and I told him that I hated it. He took one look at it and told me to stand back. He took the hammer from me and broke the mirror in two hits. Behind the mirror was a wooden door which I had no clue about. The cops kicked open the door, and there was a small room with a bed, some books, some food and clothes, and on the bed lay a skinny man. They immediately arrested him and went through his belongings. I was so scared and devastated that I did not even know how the hell my life changed so much in less than 24 hours. When they checked his phone, he too was on Tinder, and turns out he was Michael. Or should I say he was catfishing me, pretending to be Michael. When the cops interrogated him, he confessed that he had moved into the secret room soon after my aunt died and was living there rent-free for years. But then suddenly I moved in, and he could not move around the home freely. So to distract me and keep me occupied, he found out that I was on Tinder and catfished me, pretending to be the man of my dreams. He picked up some photos from the internet of a guy I might like, and his plan was working fantastically until I showed up unannounced at home that night. He used the two-way mirror to keep an eye on me. I was so traumatized by the events of that night that I moved in with my daughter and her husband for a couple of days and then sold that house to purchase an apartment for me. The guy was put behind bars, but I am still too traumatized from that event to fully open up myself to love again. And I definitely have sworn off dating apps for the rest of my life. What were you afraid of when you were kids? My fears were not unlike those of any ordinary child. Dark monsters, ghosts, and all things we don't understand and think will hurt us. I have to say that these fears were taken away from me at an early age to be replaced by something much more sinister. That day that changed my fear, I was visited by the most tetric, cruel, and real being that can exist. The human being. I will tell you about that night. 
I was only 12 years old. Too young to be able to defend myself, but too old to need a babysitter. I was going to be alone for a short time since my parents had gone to buy a few things from the supermarket. I was in my room, playing with my toys on the floor. Suddenly, I heard a strange noise coming from the living room. I stood up annoyed. I honestly thought it was my parents. Surely, they had forgotten something. I was grounded that day, so I wasn't supposed to play with my toys, and now I was sure to be discovered. I started to put away all my toys as fast as I could, hoping to hide everything in time. But if they had come back to check that I hadn't done anything, they would surely discover me. Time went by and my parents didn't come into my room, which seemed very strange to me. They always came into my room as soon as they arrived, since they had recently decided that I no longer needed a babysitter. But they were still a little paranoid. As time went by, I kept hearing footsteps, and at that moment, I realized one thing. It was only one person walking. I quickly looked out my bedroom window and noticed something that gave me goosebumps. My parents' car was gone. My parents hadn't come home yet. I looked through the half-open door of my room and saw a dark figure moving. That person wasn't either of my parents. It was something else. I stood still trying to understand what I was seeing. The figure was moving slowly through the living room. He was not wearing a mask or anything to hide his face. It was a man, tall and thin, with a smile that chilled my blood. I didn't know this man. I knew he was probably a thief, but something about him made me even more uneasy. At that time, I was too young to understand what bothered me so much about that person. But now I understand. What I was too young to notice at the time was the man's behavior. He wasn't nervous. He wasn't in a hurry, and he definitely wasn't afraid. He was having fun. To make it even worse, at that time, I also didn't realize that the man wasn't really stealing anything. He wasn't inspecting the drawers, he didn't have a bag or a backpack, and he didn't intend to run away as soon as he saw someone. The man was not looking for something. He was looking for someone. As I told you, at that moment, I was too young to make the right decisions in the face of something like that. I was paralyzed. My hands were sweating, and I felt a strong stitch in my chest that did not let me breathe. At that moment, I should have hidden, ran, screamed for help. Whatever I could have done was better than what I did. Faced with that strange figure wandering around my house, I just stood there, staring at him as if I was totally exposed. The man saw me, and his smile widened. I ran back to my room, closed the door, and hid under my bed. I heard his footsteps approaching, slow but sure. The door to my room opened slowly. I tried to hold my breath, but my heart was pounding so hard I was sure it could be heard throughout the house. Once the man entered my room, I became much more nervous and almost gave a little scream. I was surprised that the man had entered my room as if my unlocked door had put up any kind of impediment for him to do so. Once he entered the room, I could watch from under my bed as the door slowly closed. He didn't need to close it that slowly, but he was doing so that I heard the door creak and became even more desperate. A few seconds after the door closed, the light went out as well. The light was still coming through my bedroom window, so he went over to close it. We were both in absolute darkness. I could no longer see anything, and I was sure he couldn't either, which I considered an advantage. Now that I am an adult, I realize that this was part of his game. He enjoyed both of us not seeing it. He had the situation under control, because even if I escaped through the door, he would hear me do it and jump at me before I got away. In the best case scenario, I could run a few meters down the hallway and he would catch me there. This really was a no-win situation. From one second to the next, I felt a weight on top of my bed. At first, I thought the man had laid down, but I quickly realized that the weight was concentrated on just one part of the bed. The man was standing on top of it. My panic at that moment was overshadowed by my difficulty breathing. The bed was somewhat old and when he climbed on top, I was crushed to the floor. I couldn't resist my urge to cry, so I cried softly. I thought he didn't hear me, but today I realized that with the silence, it was impossible not to. He knew perfectly well where I was. Suddenly, the bed became lighter and I could breathe. I was relieved. 
I began to breathe deeper and relax. Almost for a second, I forgot about the psychopath in my room. But that relief didn't last long. At that instant, laughter was sounding from under the bed with me. The man was lying on the floor next to me. I froze, and without holding back, I began to cry. Next to me, the man pretended to be crying, mocking me. I couldn't see him as I had my back to him, but I felt his warmth next to me. Then I began to feel something walking around my waist. It was one of my toy soldiers. The soldier was poking me with his plastic gun. Even though it wasn't sharp, the pressure caused me pain. It started to hurt more and more and more as I cried nonstop and the psycho's laughter rang out throughout the room until suddenly there came a thread of hope. I heard my parents' car pulling up to the house. I used that moment to react and I shot out from under the bed, escaping my room. I ran, crying desperate without looking back. The man could have caught me if he wanted to, but I never heard his footsteps behind me. He never tried to catch me. Mom! Dad, help me! What happened, darling? Did you get hurt? Are you okay? A man! There's a horrible and big man in the house! He's in my bedroom! They quickly went to my room, but there was no one there. Just a dark room and an open window. Over the next few days, my parents checked the cameras more frequently, and to their terror, we were able to experience at least for a few seconds what I experienced. A few days after the incident, the man approached the camera, staring at it and smiling, as if provoking them. As if to say that whenever he wants, he can come back and take me away. We moved a few months later. My parents couldn't bear the thought of the man coming back one day. Do you know what helped them make the final decision? A few days after it all happened, a note appeared under my window. The note was addressed to me and said that if my parents hadn't come home that day, he would still be playing with me. Hey, my name is Ashley. I'm not going to sit here and tell you that getting back together with an ex-boyfriend is bad. In fact, I'm living with my ex-boyfriend now, and I'm actually very happy. But there are times when not everything is always so joyful. There are counters with your ex-boyfriends that can go very wrong. And today, I will tell you about one. It all started several years ago. It had been a while since I ended my relationship with David. It was a difficult separation. We were together for a long time, and parting was horrendous. But in the end, we both accepted that it was the best thing for both of us. Or at least, that's what I thought. A year after the separation, I started receiving text messages from an unknown number. At first, I thought it was just a mistake, maybe someone who had the wrong number. But the messages kept coming, and I soon realized they were from David. At first, the messages were innocent. Things like, hi, how are you? And I've been thinking about you. But soon they became more uncomfortable. Messages about how much he missed me, how sorry he was for how things ended. I felt bad, but I tried to ignore them, hoping David would eventually get tired and leave me alone. I knew he had no bad intentions towards me. He was always a very good person, but I had to understand when to stop. However, that didn't happen. The messages became more insistent and more intrusive. They started arriving at all hours of the day and night. The messages always came at very opportune times when I wasn't doing anything or when I was on my cell phone as if David was constantly watching me. I tried to block his number, but every time I did, he would just use a new number to contact me. I began to feel annoyed. I loved David, but not like this anymore. No matter where I went or what I did, he always seemed to be there, stalking me in the shadows. I began to lose sleep to feel constantly nervous and anxious. My friends tried to help me, but there wasn't much they could do. David was persistent, and I felt that nothing I wrote to him would stop him from texting me. Finally, I decided to confront him. I knew I was in no danger, as David was really a good person, so I decided to be as direct as possible for both our sakes. I couldn't keep hiding, waiting for him to disappear. I had to confront him once and for all, to put an end to this nightmare once and for all. 
We arranged to meet at a cafe, a neutral place where I could confront him without feeling too vulnerable. That day was a holiday, so most coffee shops were closed, but he invited me to a cafe near his house that he knew would be open for sure. When I arrived, I saw him sitting in a corner, staring at me with a rather obsessive expression, but I decided to ignore it and keep walking. As soon as I entered the cafeteria, he stood up and walked towards the door. As he did so, he put up a sign that it was closed. Hey, what are you doing? I made sure we have the cafeteria to ourselves. I hope you don't tell my boss. All the other cafeterias were closed. It was at that moment that I realized something. This cafeteria was totally empty. The machines were running, but there was no one serving or eating breakfast. From what David told me, I understood that he worked here and had opened it just for me. I found that attitude pretty creepy and it was a big red flag, but I was already here. I couldn't leave. Besides, it's David. He's incapable of hurting me. We sat down at a secluded table, and as soon as he opened his mouth, I knew something wasn't right. He immediately started looking at me blankly, and the things he was saying didn't make sense. He treated me as if we had never broken up, as if I was still his girlfriend. I tried to keep my composure, trying to reason with him, to make him understand that it was over and that he needed to leave me alone. But he refused to listen to me, clinging desperately to the idea that we could still be together, that our love was indestructible. That's when things started to get really scary. He would talk about how we would be together forever, how he would do anything to keep us together, even if it meant hurting those that got in our way. I got up from the table, feeling a shiver run down my spine. I had to leave. I had to get away from him before it was too late. But as I turned to leave, I realized I couldn't do it anymore. David was standing in front of me, a twisted smile on his face. His eyes were shining with a sickly light and they were staring wildly at me, trying to keep their composure. You can't escape us. We'll be together forever. You and I. In life and in death. I ran for the exit, but he was right behind me. I tried to run out into the street, screaming and desperately calling for help, but no one would help me. And then the inevitable happened. I felt a cold, clammy hand close over my shoulder, stopping me in my tracks. I turned slowly trembling with fear, and met David's empty, lifeless eyes staring at me with a blood-chilling intensity. I told you that you couldn't escape true love. And then, in an instant, I felt a wet handkerchief on my nose. I began to feel dizzy, and everything went black. I woke up in a dark, damp room, with the sound of drops falling all around me. The place was filthy, and the walls were eaten away by all the moisture. I tried to get up, but discovered that I was tied to a chair, my hands and feet held tightly by rough, worn ropes. Then I saw him. David was standing in front of me with a wild, unhinged look in his eyes. He held a knife in his hand, its blade glinting in the dim light of the room. Now we will be together forever. Nothing and no one can ever separate us. Welcome home. I tried to scream, to struggle to free myself from my bonds, but it was useless. I remember believing I was trapped at the mercy of a man who had gone completely mad. David brought his knife close to my body and told me that he would never do anything to me, that it was just in case I wanted to escape. And that was when my life changed forever. Remember how I told you I live with my ex now? Well, this is David. Today we are much better. I don't agree that he kidnapped me but I am somewhat grateful to him. It was the only way I could know true love. A few years went by and no one ever came for me. At first, I was sad and scared, but today I realize that it is a blessing. David is very good, and he gives me everything I need. I don't need to go out. I don't need to have a life and meet more people. David is all I need. What are you doing, honey? Just writing another story. Oh, I'm glad. You always were a good writer. I'd like to read it when you're finished. Of course, love. Hey, do you think I can go out to the square today? I'd like to get some air. You know I can't let you do that. If I do, people will realize that we live in this abandoned place. Besides, you could run away, and neither of us want that, do we? No, of course we don't. Thank you very much, David. You make me very happy. 
and you make me happy. Hello, my name is Richard, and I've been in a relationship for about five years. I met my girlfriend on Tinder, and since then, everything has been wonderful. You know, it's a miracle that I'm with my girlfriend since I have a dark history with Tinder. Let's just say that on Tinder, there are very good people and very bad people. And among a tiny percentage, hidden among the meanest people, there is Angela, the most cruel and evil person I have ever met. In the beginning, Angela didn't really seem like a bad person. I found her on Tinder and she stood out among all the girls. At first, I thought there was no way she was going to like me back. She was too cute for me, and I knew it, but it didn't hurt to try. As soon as I gave her a like, I left my cell phone and went to get something to eat. But as soon as I was leaving, my cell phone rang. It was a notification from Tinder, and to my absolute surprise, I had made a match with Angela. After that, everything went pretty smoothly. We started talking, and to my amazement, Angela was charming. She had a magnetic personality that immediately grabbed me. We shared similar tastes. We had the same sense of humor, and our conversations were fluid and engaging. Days passed, then weeks, and our virtual connection grew stronger. Everything was going great until we decided to meet. One cold autumn night, Angela suggested we meet in a secluded spot. Although it seemed strange, I didn't question it. Maybe she liked quiet places. Not all girls were restaurant people or crowd pleasers. We met in a small dark park where the shadows stretched out like long fingers of darkness. When I arrived, Angela was already there a charming smile on her face. To my surprise, she set something down beside her. Hey, what did you bring a Polaroid for? To capture moments. Sit down, you'll understand. We sat on a bench and for a while, everything was normal. Angela asked me a bit about my life and I asked her a bit about hers. Nothing separated this date from a normal one, but gradually, the atmosphere changed. Hey, have you ever killed any animals? What? Wh Excuse me? I was joking. Calm down. I thought you had a sense of humor. Even though she told me it was a joke, something in her eyes had changed. Before she had a calm, attentive, and careful look. Now it was very different. Her eyes were wide open. Her gaze was fixed on me. Her head was shaking, and I could see her biting the skin on her lips in anticipation. The date started to get a lot more awkward. I was trying to bring up normal topics. Movies, work, college. Whatever would make this talk normal again. But something had changed in her. It was as if she had lost complete interest in whatever I was saying. By this point in the evening, I was very uncomfortable and could only think of one excuse to leave. Hey, I've had a great time, but uh, I think I should go. My mother is sick and I have to take care of her. I could get away for a while, but I feel like I've left her alone for too long. Oh, of course. I understand. Are you very close to your mother? Of course. I never knew my father, and my mother took care of me and my siblings by herself when we were kids. She is very brave. You know, I'm very close to my mom, too. Do you want to see a picture of her before you go? Of course. Angela reached for a picture on her cell phone. Suddenly, she was acting more normal. Maybe I was being a little over the top with her. As she reached for the picture on her cell phone, I couldn't help but notice how cute she was. It was as if she had a glow of her own, a unique joy that made her unlike anyone I had ever met before. Here, I found a picture of her. Look at it. I grabbed the cell phone eagerly, and when I looked at the screen, I was confused at first. At first, I was confused, but when I understood what I was seeing, I froze. In the picture, there was a woman who looked very similar to Angela, but she was dead, dismembered, cut into pieces. Angela was in the picture, too. Blood was all over her body, especially on her face, which had a huge smile and eyes similar to the ones she had a few minutes ago. A flash brought me back to reality. She was with the Polaroid in her hand, taking a picture of me. See, you always have to be ready to capture the best moments. You should see your reaction. Angela, tell me this is a joke. Tell me this is a joke in bad taste. Please tell me this is not real. It's all a joke. You have nothing to worry about. As I was saying that, something shone against my face. That's when I realized that Angela had a huge knife in her hands. Before she could use it, I got up from my chair and started to run. I watched as Angela reacted to try to grab me before I left, but she didn't do it fast enough. I ran as fast as I could. I had to get away from that place. I had to get to a police station to report what I saw. It might just be a person with a knife who I had already left behind, but I felt that the danger was more latent than ever. As I ran, I heard an engine behind me and saw a speeding car. It was Angela. 
I tried to get off the road as quickly as possible, but it was too late. Before I could jump out, she hit me with the car on the side of my body, and I fell down injured. Angela braked her car a few meters later and headed towards me. The park had already ended, and I was in an area with huge grassland and several trees. Luckily for me, I was able to crawl in the dark and hide behind a tree. Angela was looking for me, walking slowly, examining the whole area. She didn't know where I was, but I felt that every step I took, she was getting a little closer. For a moment, I came to believe that she really did see me, only that she was making me suffer as long as possible. She was already a few steps away from me. She was going to kill me. And she was just going to make one more antidote of Angela. One more picture for her collection. I wanted to defend myself, but my body hurt too much. I couldn't even stand up. Suddenly, as Angela was about to find me, a group of friends walked by. Hey, are you okay? <laughs> of course. I just lost a, a ring. You can go. Thank you very much. Don't worry. We'll help you look for it. No! I've... I've already found it. Thank you very much anyway. And that's when it was all over. Angela simply went back to her car and sped off, to the confused looks of the other guys, knowing she was clearly lying, but not interested enough to investigate what Angela was really looking for. I took advantage of that moment to crawl away from that area, and when I had reached a point where Angela would not find me, I called one of my brothers who picked me up. Once my brother dropped me off at the hospital, I called the police, but they couldn't find Angela. She had no social networks, her Tinder profile had disappeared, and she had made sure that no clues led back to her. I even doubt that her real name is Angela. As I told you before, I gave Tinder a try again, and that time, it worked out well. I met my current partner in a public place, and I had already seen all her social networks before we met. I never heard from Angela again, and to tell you the truth, I'm thankful I didn't. Who knows what Angela might have done, who she might have met on Tinder. And what fate would have befallen those poor people who perhaps, unlike me, could not escape? It's been two weeks since my husband and I moved into the peaceful neighborhood of Fairmount, Philadelphia. And these two weeks have been the best of my life. The sunsets here in Fairmount were incredible. They look like paintings in the sky with shades of pink and purple that seem to go on forever. Every morning, my husband and I would sit on our porch and watch the sunset talking and laughing. He would tell me about the colleague at work who wore an orange tie on a red shirt, and I would tell him about the old woman who lived across the street and how she went on and on about how I would like her son who lived in the States, like she had no idea I was married. Those were some of my favorite moments spent with him. Actually, every moment spent with him was my favorite. Mark Reeves was an incredible man, and I really loved him. Everyone talked about how marriages were tough and whatnot. But with Mark, he made things easy, and most importantly, he made me happy. But unfortunately, our happiness didn't last forever. It all started on the 6th of July, 2017. That morning, I had just finished tending to my plants in the little garden I have on my front porch and was heading back inside when a very chilly air hit me. It was the kind of air that had nothing to do with the weather. It was the kind of chilly air that came with bad news. I stood still for a while, trying to shake off the feeling that had started to grow in the pit of my stomach. With a slow turn, I looked behind to see if I would see anything out of place, but everything seemed normal, exactly as they'd been left. The mailbox looked empty, except for the few flyers and even the residents of Fairmount seemed normal as they went about their everyday activities. I didn't know exactly what I was looking for, but I was now certain it wasn't there. So with a heavy sigh, I opened my door and went in. Later that day, I heard the sound of my husband's car pulling up outside, and I felt a wave of relief wash over me. He had just come back from the car repair shop with the car he dropped off almost a week ago. Once Mark walked in, while I got the dinner table ready for dinner, I then served him the meal I prepared for him. After his dinner, we settled on the couch in the living room to watch a movie and asked each other how our days went. The movie came to an end around 11.30 p.m. My eyes were getting heavy now, and I could tell Mark was tired as well. So I suggested we both went to bed. Just as we were about to get up from the couch, we heard the doorbell ring. I looked at Mark and he looked back at me with a confused expression on his face. We both wondered who it could have possibly been at this time of night. With a reassuring smile at my husband, I checked the door cam and I saw a man standing on the front porch. Instantly, all the color drained from my face. What I saw was not what I expected as the man seemed anything but normal. His eyes were red and swollen his teeth completely yellow. There was a deranged smile plastered across his face as he stared straight into my door's camera. 
I didn't know who he was, but I didn't want him there. After a few seconds of silence, the strange man brought his face closer to our door cam before saying, Stephen's here. His voice was hoarse from either the cigarettes he'd been smoking or the alcohol he drank. I was terrified, but I managed to utter the words, You got the wrong house. I didn't care to ask what he was looking for. All I knew was there was something entirely creepy about him and I wanted him gone. With a dark chuckle, the man responded with, <laughs> I knew this was a ripoff. His laugh had to be one of the most terrifying sounds I'd ever heard. So with my heart racing, I asked, What are you looking for, Stephen? His eyes lit up at my question in a maniacal way as he said, I'm looking for Fifi. Confused as to who he was looking for, I responded with, Fifi? Again? You got the wrong house. Stephen then looked straight into the door cam before saying, So do you want to have sex tonight? Shocked at his response, I turned to look back at my husband, who also had a confused look on his face. I'd noticed Mark had brought out a gun from one of the hidden drawers in the living room where we kept it for situations like these. Not knowing Mark had a weapon, I told Stephen, Sir, my husband is in the living room with a gun. I'd hoped the threat was enough to send him away, but Stephen, who now had a smug look on his face, simply said, <laughs> Okay. Having cleared up the confusion, I told Stephen, Have a good night, hoping that would finally get him to leave. Luckily it did, as he responded with, Understood. Before walking off my front porch, my heart was still beating hard in my chest as I watched him leave. I knew telling him Mark had a gun was the best thing I could have done. But just when I thought it was all over, I heard heavy footsteps coming toward our house and it was followed by loud banging on the door. I froze as I didn't think he would come back and I could hear him screaming the words, Open this door, Fifi, and give me what I want. Frightened, I screamed back, Fifi isn't here. I am Claudia. I hoped to reason with the clearly insane man, but my words only seemed to make things worse as the banging on the door got louder. Mark threatened him again, but he didn't stop, so we decided to call the police. However, right before we could get to our phones, a large rock came hurtling through our window. It shattered the entire glass, and before we knew it, the crazed Stephen was now standing in our living room. Mark hurriedly shot his gun as Stephen rushed towards him. He wasn't an experienced gunman, so his first shot missed, and the second hit Stephen in the shoulder. He let out a scream and a lot of curse words, but that didn't stop him from approaching us. Once he got into close range, Stephen disarmed Mark and placed his large hands around his neck. I watched in horror as he started to squeeze the life out of my husband. The deranged smile on his face seemed even larger now as he continued to strangle Mark. My entire body was crippled with fear, but I wasn't going to let the love of my life die, so I took the large metal lamp that was right next to me and brought it down on Stephen's head. I heard a disturbing crack as he slumped to the floor and a pool of blood slowly started to form around his head. A guttural scream left my mouth as I saw Stephen's motionless body lying there, and the thought that I had possibly just killed a man suffocated me. Mark, who was still recovering, rushed towards me and took me in his arms as I cried uncontrollably. He held me tight and rubbed soothing circles along my back. I'm guessing all the commotion caused one of our neighbors to call the authorities, as it wasn't long before we heard the sounds of the police sirens. We gave our statements in addition to the door cam footage once the authorities arrived, and Stephen, who survived the attack, was arrested and thrown in jail. It's been almost a month since the incident. Both I and Mark had to undergo numerous therapy sessions as we showed signs of post-traumatic stress and we were told we would need a lot of counseling to move on. I was later informed that the authorities had looked into Stephen's case and it was revealed that Stephen had actually come to see one of our neighbor's daughters, a 12-year-old girl named Fifi. He simply mistook the number on the house and arrived at ours. It was also revealed that Stephen was behind the abduction of numerous 12 to 15 year old girls in South Philadelphia and that the police had been looking for him for months. The authorities were still looking into his motives for the kidnappings, but they hadn't figured it out yet and Stephen didn't want to talk. It took a long time, but I and Mark were able to slowly move past the terrifying incident. However, on certain nights, whenever I close my eyes, I still see Stephen's face looming above me and I can feel his hands around my neck strangling the life out of me for putting him in jail. The disturbing story you just heard was loosely based on the real-life case of Stephen Corbin, a deranged man who terrorized a couple's home in Fairmount, Philadelphia. Stephen, who was clearly intoxicated, had mixed up his addresses and arrived at the wrong one. After being told to leave, Stephen proceeded to assault the young couple before he was incapacitated and eventually escorted away by the police. 
Luckily, the entire interaction was recorded on the couple's door cam, and it was used as evidence in the investigation that was carried out by the authorities. Steven here. You got the wrong house. <laughs> I knew this was a ripoff. Okay, what, are you looking for a Steven? No, I am Steven. I'm looking for uh, Fifi. Yeah, you got the wrong house. So, you don't want to have sex tonight? Uh, sir, my husband's in the living room with the gun. Huh. Okay. Have a good Understood. night. <laughs> How many of you have had sleep paralysis? You know when you are lying down on your bed, fall asleep, but your brain is still awake? In those moments, you are completely helpless. If it has ever happened to you, just imagine it. Your body is completely frozen, but you can see everything that happens. As you are half asleep, the waking world is combined with your most terrifying nightmares. You can see all kinds of demons, beasts, and wild animals walking towards you. And the more you try to move, the more you try to wake up, the more scared you get, triggering even worse nightmares. Sounds really scary, doesn't it? Now imagine how terrifying this was for me. A person who always had sleep paralysis, but one time... The terror became more real than ever. For the shadow that haunted me that night was not part of a nightmare, nor something that would go away when I woke up. It was a real person. To be honest, sleep paralysis was something that terrified me as a child, but not so much as an adult. I had it so many times that I was used to it. I knew all the techniques to cope with sleep paralysis. Wiggle my fingers a little at a time, don't get desperate, don't sleep on my side, and once awake, don't fall asleep immediately and go and wet my face a little so that it doesn't happen again. If you have it chronically, sleep paralysis is something you live with. But that night, it was different. That night, I had a different sleep paralysis. When I have sleep paralysis, I see all kinds of shadows and monsters walking around me. But when I calm down, all the shadows go away. But this time, it was different. This time, there was a shadow that behaved totally differently. This one didn't come to attack me or do anything potentially dangerous. It was just looking at me, walking slowly around my room, approaching me little by little and inspecting me. Even though I tried to calm as much as I could, even though I tried to imagine other things to make the shadow disappear, it was still there. I began to despair. I tried to breathe, but it was getting harder and harder. Meanwhile, the shadow was still there, watching me with a lot of intrigue and malice. And suddenly... I just woke up. It was already daylight in my house, and I was alone without danger. From that day on, everything went from bad to worse. I kept having sleep paralysis even more frequently than usual. The visits of that shadow became more and more frequent, to the point where I got to see her every day. But none of her visits were the same as before. Every time I had sleep paralysis, every time I saw that shadow, I was more and closer and closer. I didn't know what it was that made me dream of that shadow, but I knew that every day I woke up worse and that there was nothing I could do to avoid it. Everything kept escalating until one day I reached the limit. That night I had sleep paralysis like the other days, but unlike other times, the shadow was behaving differently. At first I didn't see it. My room was empty and I was trying to keep my composure and move my fingers a little at a time as not to dream of anything too scary. But suddenly, as if it had been there all the time, the shadow appeared, and this time, it was in front of me. I could see his eyes twitching from side to side in a sickly way. His smile was huge and marked, and his body seemed to be drowned in a shadow that did not allow me to see anything in detail. Once in front of me, this strange being stuck out its long, horrible tongue and began to run across my face. Subtly, but obsessively. Everything felt so real. It was as if it was really there torturing me and enjoying every second I was asleep. I tried to use all my strength to wake up. 
my body ache, and the terror grew greater and greater with each passing second. I felt like I couldn't breathe, but somehow I had to wake up. In a last desperate attempt, I screamed at the top of my lungs and woke up, giving a short, dry scream in the middle of the night. Once awake, I breathed, agitated and nervous. That was the worst sleep paralysis I had ever had in my life. I put my hands on my face to wake up a little more, and that's when I realized the worst thing possible. My face. My face was full of saliva. With my eyes already adjusted to the darkness, I looked ahead, and that's when I saw him. There was a man in front of me. He was just sitting in my chair, staring at me with a huge grin from ear to ear. I knew that smile. I knew that way of looking at me, and I knew that man. He acted exactly like the shadow I saw in my sleep paralysis. It was at that moment that I realized that the shadow was not part of my imagination. It was a real man. A man who came to my house every day. A man who started observing me from a distance, and little by little, he encouraged himself to get closer to me. To the point of standing next to me and licking me. Discovered, the man approached me once again, showing me a terrifying knife, and with a smile he said to me, See you soon, whether you fall asleep or not. After saying those words to me, I could only stay on the bed completely static, while he left through the window. After that, I called the police and told them everything. In disbelief and confusion, they told me they would keep an eye on the area, but just in case, I went to sleep a few nights in a hotel. Shortly after, I found out that the man was arrested. His name was Mark Anthony Gonzalez, and apparently, I was the first man he attacked. This psychopath was into breaking into women's homes and touching their feet. He always escaped from the scene of the crime when they woke up, but because of my inability to wake up from sleep paralysis, he became obsessed with me. I never heard from this man again. I only know that he is behind bars. As for me, I still have sleep paralysis almost every night, but this time I have a security system in my house to wake me up in case someone breaks in. Who knows what things could happen to me while I'm sleeping? Most people enjoy being home alone. It's always good to spend time alone. I'm Molly, and I was never one who liked it. Not after what happened to me when I was at the tender age of nine. I tried to find joy in it as I grew older, and I've gotten to a point where I am at ease during the day, but nights are always a hard pass. For a backstory, my mom passed away giving birth to my baby brother Jackson. This was back in the 90s before we had cell phones. The power had gone out and my mom went into labor. My dad tried to get her to the hospital, but something went wrong and she bled out on the way. They were able to save Jackson, but my mother was gone, leaving an empty hole in mine and my dad's hearts. Tragically, I lost both my parents that night. After my mom passed, my dad just checked out. I started missing a lot of school, and it felt as though I was taking care of Jackson more than my dad did. My grandma, his mother, would often come take care of me and my baby brother while he disappeared for hours at a time. When he came home, I could smell the alcohol on him, and sometimes hints of perfume mixed in with his cologne. I asked her where he goes, and she was always vague about the answers, as though she was protecting me from the truth. Grandma, where does Daddy go when he leaves? He goes to your mother's grave to visit her. He misses her very much, you know. Why doesn't he take me with him? I miss her, too. I was still trying to process death and the fact my mom was gone. At her funeral, my dad hardly looked at me, and he still hasn't held Jackson, despite the fact it's been six months. I know now that he resented Jackson, blamed him for my mother dying to bring him into the world. Your dad is grieving and wants you to understand what happened before he takes you to visit her. That answer never made sense to me, but she said it every single time. It wasn't like my father explained anything to me. One night, he went out, and he had been gone longer than usual. The phone rang around 4 a.m., and Grandma picked it up. 
I stood in the hallway, peering around the corner, listening to whatever I could catch. She hung up the phone and spotted me, put a smile on her face. Your dad needs me to go pick him up. Jackson is sound asleep. You're nine years old. Can you be a big girl for a few minutes and listen for him while I go get him? Why do you need to go get him? He has a car. He had a little too many big boy drinks, and I need to make sure he gets home safe. But if it's a big boy drink, why does he need to ride home? He's a big boy. My grandma stifled a laugh and put her hand over her mouth as though it would stop the giggling. He really is a big boy, but sometimes big people mess up too. Tonight, he really goofed up. I don't want to wake Jackson, so can you please be a big girl and watch over him? I was uneasy at the thought, but agreed. Something about doing what a big girl does felt empowering, and my grandma trusted me to keep my baby brother safe while she was gone. She locked the door behind her as she left. I didn't want to sit alone in the dark, so I turned on a movie in the living room and kept it quiet. The bright colors of the cartoons I was watching was distracting my mind of the fact I was home alone, late at night, with my little brother down the hall. All seemed to be going well, until I heard some humming coming from his room. I thought for a moment Grandma was back, but that hum sounded familiar. I tiptoed down the hallway. The humming got louder as I approached. I felt a sinking feeling in the pit of my stomach. Goosebumps formed on my skin as a horrible fear took over. I realized that that hum sounded like my mother. I peeked into Jackson's room, and a woman in a nightgown covered in blood hovered over Jackson's crib, humming a tune my mom used to hum to me. My voice quivered as I called out for her. Mommy? This woman turned to look at me. Her face was pale. Her eyes were sunk in. A sinister smile crept across her lips as she glanced at me. Molly, it's Mommy. I've missed you so much. Will you come to me? I backed away in fear. Whoever... Whatever this was, was not my mother. She looked like her, sounded like her. But my mom was always warm and comforting. This thing had me feeling terrified. She stepped closer to me, and I backed away more. Take my hand, Molly. You could be with Mommy forever. I shook my head. I wasn't sure if what I did was out of fear or instinct but I did not speak to her. I just kept backing away. Her tone grew colder. Molly, I said, come with me. I turned to run and smacked into my grandma, who held up a rosary and said a prayer. The woman disappeared, but I began to cry in my grandma's arms. It turned out to be an evil spirit that was mimicking my mother. My grandma explained to me that she'd heard her around the house before. She said that since my mom died, my dad started dabbling in things he shouldn't have to contact her and welcomed a demon instead. The house was blessed, and we never saw her again. But that humming? If I'm alone at night, it still haunts me to this day. I don't know what was worse, losing my mother or something imitating her to mock my pain. My dad eventually straightened out, but the relationship with him was strained, and Jackson knows where he stands with him. It's heartbreaking, and dad is trying, but I think whatever that demon was attached itself to him. Hey, my name is Leonard. I currently hold a very important position in the information security sector at a place I can't mention. But I can tell you it's pretty big and important. Many have a very long journey to get to where I am, but others like me started studying programming when they were very young. Do you know what it was that got me so interested in learning so fast about computer security? Well, what I lived through that night, that night that uh, I thought I was home alone, 
but without knowing it. I was trapped in a hell, from which the only way I got out alive was a miracle. It all started on a Tuesday night in my apartment. I had moved in a few days before, and the internet company had taken their time to install the service for me. I had spent the whole day surfing the internet since I was on vacation for two more weeks, and both my girlfriend and friends were busy working full time. Anyway, I wanted to get some content to start a YouTube channel of mysteries, so I was going uh, to some pretty weird sites. I found all the sites on Reddit since I was never a big fan of the dark web. I'm not one of those people who was looking for trouble with the wrong people. Maybe that was my mistake, thinking that only bad people were on the deep web. As I was browsing through various sites, I came across one that caught my attention. It was a page where everyone spoke in different languages. And by different languages, I don't mean that they were speaking in English and Spanish. I could recognize that they spoke English, Spanish, Portuguese, Italian, French, Russian, and many more languages that, honestly, I, I didn't know. The weirdest thing was that, even though it was 2 a.m., they were all talking in a pop-up chat that opened up on the screen. I started taking pictures and pictures and then translating what they were saying. I understood the messages in English, of course, and some in Spanish, but none of them said anything relevant. They were planning to find someone, but without seeing the rest of the messages, I, I couldn't understand the context. After translating the messages, I understood what was going on. The person that they wanted to find was me. They were talking about an invader, and they were sharing with each other an IP number. After checking, I realized that that IP number was mine. I panicked and left the page. I restarted the computer and the modem. Luckily, I had a modem with a variable IP. This meant that every time I restarted the modem, I had a new IP, which was perfect in case they tried to do something to me with my old IP number. As I rebooted the computer, I was a little scared. But at the same time, I, I was quite happy. With all the pictures I'd taken, I was sure I could make a great first video of this. Who knows? Maybe I could even start a horror story, and I could be the main character. On reflex, I logged into my social networks as soon as the computer turned back on, and that's when I realized something. I had more than 30 chat requests on WhatsApp web, all from unknown numbers from different parts of the world that were talking to me in code that I didn't really understand. At that moment, I panicked. This was no longer something as innocent as finding a person's IP. I mean, that was weird, but I knew a lot of people who could easily do that. Now, how do you explain to me that all these people suddenly had my cell phone number? This was getting personal. I started nervously blocking as many numbers as I could, but as fast as I blocked one, another one would talk to me. After a few minutes of blocking numbers, I realized that I was getting numbers that I'd already blocked. None of this made any kind of sense to me, and you know what? It got much worse. As time went on, I just started to ignore the messages. I thought about getting a new number, but when I logged in out of curiosity and saw the new messages, I realized that that wasn't going to work either. I looked at the files that they were sending to me in terror. I knew I didn't have to open any of the files, but the preview was enough to know what I was going to find. They were pictures. Pictures of my house. I ran to the window and saw only people walking by. Were they the ones who had taken the pictures of me? Maybe they were. Maybe they weren't. They could be anyone. I panicked and told all my friends to come and spend the night with me when they got off of work. My girlfriend wanted to come too, but I didn't want to expose her to whatever was going on here. After a few more hours, I began to calm down, knowing that my friends were already leaving work, and little by little some of them would be coming to my house. I sat patiently, listening for any noise, checking the messages these strange people were sending me. The pictures had stopped coming about 30 minutes ago. I wondered if they'd calmed down, 
or did they know I was waiting for them? My thoughts were interrupted by a noise at the front door. Someone was knocking. I quickly checked my WhatsApp, and none of my friends had said that they were here. I didn't know who was knocking at the door, but it wasn't my friends. I approached the door with a huge knife I had taken from the kitchen. He- Hello? Who is it? There was no answer, and after a few seconds, there was another knock on the door. Leave, now! There are people coming, and I'll call the police. You don't want to be here when they arrive. Stop harassing me, or you'll be arrested. I grabbed my cell phone and quickly called the police. The phone rang for only a few seconds, and they answered, but the person who answered wasn't a police officer. Meet the eye. Follow the eye. Find your past and your future. The eye is watching. I cut the phone in terror and ran to the kitchen door. I had to get out of there, even if it was just through the back door. I ran as fast as I could, but just as I was about to open the door, someone opened it for me. I recoiled in terror as four men in black robes and white masks came through the door. All the masks were different, but terrifying in equal measure. Who are you? What are you doing here? What do you want? Suddenly, I stopped hearing banging on the front door. Someone put a key in and just opened it. I panicked at the thought of these people that they could come in whenever they wanted. They were just knocking on the door to scare me. After the front door opened, five other people came in and locked me in. I was totally cornered. Cornered by almost ten people in black robes with masks on their faces. They were all over six foot tall. Probably had platforms or something like that to make them taller. If so, I could surely escape by grabbing one of them. But did I really want to take the risk? All the walls started to close in around me. These people kept closing in on me, taking small steps that cornered me. I could only stand against the wall, pointing out my knife, uselessly. At some point, I was going to have to defend myself. But I didn't know how. I was afraid that everything would be much worse if I did. When the people finished locking me in, I could see how they took something out of their pockets. The worst was about to begin. I tried to resist as much as I could, but there were so many of them, and I was so scared that I couldn't move. All these people took syringes out of their pockets and stuck them all over my body. All these syringes had liquid in them that I didn't know what it was. I resisted as much as I could. I was able to throw some of the syringes away, but they were too much. My body felt weak from one moment to the next, as if I was falling asleep. I saw more people with syringes entering the room, sticking them into me without any resistance. After that, nothing was the same. I woke up the next day and the first thing I did was vomit. My body felt terrible. I had horrible feelings that I'd never had before in my life. I checked my cell phone, and in confusion, I realized that none of my friends had messaged me. But the strange thing was that I hadn't messaged them either. I checked the WhatsApp web on my computer and realized that the page said WhatsApp web without the second P in WhatsApp. That chat, that chat was fake. I never really warned my friends to come. I went to the hospital immediately, and they found nothing out of the ordinary. But since then, my body feels terrible. Sometimes I, I see people spying on me and walking near my house, smiling at me. Since that day, I, I never feel alone. I have the feeling that they're always there, spying on me. I started to study computer security, thinking that I'd be able to find these people and know if they were still watching me, but it doesn't make sense. My body is getting weaker, and I'm starting to get weirder and weirder illnesses that make me weaker 
and weirder. I spent the last few days alone, separated from my girlfriend, fighting with my friends, waiting for whatever happens to me to happen. I don't think I'll ever learn anything from these people. I don't think I have much time to do it either. Maybe, just maybe, this is just another way to spend my time before the bitter end. Looking back at this incident now, after several years, gives me chills. But back then, I had no clue how much danger I was in. So, since middle school, I've always been a nerdy kid. Don't get me wrong, I'm not one of those boys who sit in the library and have no friends and aces all the tests. Quite the opposite, actually. I was a football player, quite popular in my school, had tons of friends and a booming social life. But along with all that, I loved to study and learn. Getting good grades and making my family proud was one of the things I enjoyed doing. Many a times I used to skip going out with my friends to just stay home and read or study. You could call me the perfect blend of nerdy and popular. At least, that's what my mom used to call me. But fast forward to a couple of years and now I was in my senior year of high school. While most of my friends were busy partying and enjoying their lives, I used to be cooped up in my room preparing for the SATs. I did participate in school activities and sports, but my main focus was getting into a good college. I lived in a small town, and I knew I had to get out of there if I wanted to do something with my life. And at that time, studying hard seemed like the only way out. My parents were both doctors. They met while completing their residency, fell in love, got married and had three kids, and settled in this small town. They are like the go-to doctors of the town, and I too aspire to be a doctor like them one day. My two younger sisters were 14 and 12 when I was in my senior year at age 17, and life was going pretty great for all of us. We lived in a two-story house and had everything we needed. We were never super rich, but we were doing just fine. However, as my senior year progressed, I started to focus more and more on my studies. Everything else had become a distraction. I knew getting into a good med school was tough, as it is, but getting a scholarship was even tougher. Everyone around me saw that I was in my own shell most of the time. As the exams got closer, I hardly hung out with my friends from school and even spent very little time with my parents and sisters with whom I loved to play. That was when I received my first note. It was written on a small piece of paper and left in my school's locker. My locker is mostly stuffed with books, stationery, and test papers. It used to have my sports gear in it too, but since I decided to solely focus on my studies, I just took it all back home. The note was left above the stack of books in my locker. I picked it up and opened it. With a pencil, someone had scribbled the words, How are your studies going? I read the note and laughed to myself and threw it in the nearest bin. I absolutely didn't think much of it. I thought it must be one of my teammates messing with me or something, so I just moved on with my day as usual. A week later, I found another note on the same spot in my locker. This note said, You did not answer the previous note. Why? I didn't know my secret admirer wanted a reply. I thought to myself and tucked this note in the back pocket of my pants and moved on with my day. This time neither did I think much of it. However, a few days later when I was walking our pet dog down the block at night, it felt as if someone was following me. My dog is a chihuahua, so it wasn't as if he was going to protect me or anything. Our town is a safe place, despite being fairly big. We had a low crime rate, and our neighborhood was one of the safest ones. I still felt unsafe at that point and just walked back home. The next day, as soon as I woke up, I heard my mom and dad talking in the kitchen. Usually, they keep their voices low and my sisters get to sleep, but today, they were almost yelling. They never really yelled in the house, no matter what, so I knew that something was wrong. I went downstairs and saw a scared look in my mother's eyes. She was panicking, and my dad was on a call with someone, yelling at the person on the opposite side. I asked my mom what had happened, and she pointed towards our back door. I went outside and saw big footprints going all around our house. Big, muddy footprints. None of us wore gumboots, and we didn't go anywhere muddy, so whose footprints were they? I was immediately worried about my two baby sisters who loved to spend time in our backyard and the front garden. As soon as my dad was off the call, he told me that he noticed the footprints when he went out to grab the newspaper. 
Someone was walking around our house at night while we were sleeping. My youngest sister's room is near the backyard, and her window was open all night. That person could have easily harmed her. Now I knew why my mom and dad were so tense and worried. Dad called the cops, as we don't have any CCTV cams or ring cameras. The cops could hardly do anything. But this had taken a toll on my dad, so he installed some cameras all around our house and even in the hallways of our house. A week later, when I was walking back home from school, I again had a feeling that someone was following me. Only this time it was daytime, so I turned around to check my surroundings. I couldn't spot anyone suspicious, so I continued walking. The hair on the back of my neck was standing up. I had a sinking feeling in my gut that someone was still following me. I walked calmly home and kept on checking behind me periodically. As soon as I got home, I locked the front door, the back door, and all the windows on the ground floor of the house. I was home alone as mom and dad were at their respective practices and my sisters were in school. Usually I would freshen up and start studying, but that day, I kept looking out the windows to see if anyone was outside the house or not. An hour went by and nothing happened. Finally, I began studying. Something I should mention about my study sessions is the fact that I sit and study in one place for hours at end. I enjoy listening to soothing music while studying, so most of the time you'll find me studying with headphones over my ears. Around the evening, Mom and Dad and both my sisters arrived home. I took a break and chatted with all of them. I didn't mention the fact that someone was following me back home or else Dad and Mom would have unnecessarily worried and my sisters would get scared. That evening was our family dinner evening meaning each month on the third Friday, we go out to eat in a restaurant as a family. My sisters were excited as usual, and my parents too were looking forward to it. I, on the other hand, had a ton of homework, and I had to do some studying. So, for the first time in my life, I didn't go with our family on Friday dinner. Instead, I asked my parents to bring me back a cheeseburger and leftovers, if there were any. After my family was out for their dinner around 8 in the evening, I grabbed myself some snacks and a bottle of water and sat at my table in the room, ready for another long study session. My study table is right in front of my room's door, so whenever I sit to study, my back is to the open door. This evening was no exception. I was studying and studying, doing my homework, going over a few test papers, preparing notes and whatnot. I was all alone in the house, and I knew I would be alone until midnight as my sisters took a long time to eat and never returned without having ice cream at their favorite ice cream parlor in town. I didn't know how the hours passed by, and suddenly there was a tap on my shoulder. I removed my headphones, paused the music, and turned around to find my mom behind me, and the look in her eyes had me instantly worried. What happened, mom? She just kept staring at me, then moved to the side. My eyes landed on the floor, and right behind me on the floor were muddy footprints, the same gumboot prints Dad had found around the porch the other day. I was stunned. Dad told me that the lock was broken and there were muddy footprints not just around the house and the driveway, but also inside the house. They stopped right behind my chair and then went back downstairs and out the front door and disappeared down the street. This means that while I was busy studying with my headphones on, someone had broken into our house and was standing behind me. One camera was also installed right outside of my room covering the hallway and the stairs, and what she found stunned us all. A man wearing a big trench coat walked up to our house. He walked through our flower garden, and that's why his boots were so muddy. He walked around our house twice checking all the windows and the back doors. When he didn't find anything open, he grabbed a big axe out of his coat and broke the lock. He walked all over the house and then finally climbed the stairs to my room. He entered it and stood there behind me with an axe in hand for two hours straight, just staring at me. And all that time, I didn't even turn from the chair, not once. Then finally, after so long, he just left. The cops arrived and took the footage with them. But they couldn't find any leads, and for the rest of my high school year, my family and I lived in dread. As soon as I was done with school, I had got admission to Harvard. My family moved there with me, even now when I think about that incident. We still have no idea who that man was and what he wanted.